Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning into this episode of Wolpert's AudioCast series. My name is Dylan Thomas. I'm a director of cloud solutions at Wolpert, and joining me today is Nate Wilhelmy. Ah, hello, Dylan. It's great to be here. Thanks. So Nate is the head of our product engineering team at Wolpert, and he has a lot of experience in building robust, scalable systems at a variety of uh, organizations, including Wolpert. And today, I really wanted to sit down with him and actually talk about some of that experience um, overall, but then focus a little bit in the time that we have on how we've been doing that at Wolpert. And the reason I want to do that is I think the cloud native stack can sound pretty much like buzzword soup to technical and business leaders at this point, trying to make a decision about how to build things. So I just wanted to ask Nate some questions about how we do engineering on the product side of things at Wolpert and what kind of technical decisions we've made on a couple of those products and just de demystify it a little bit with some examples. So, uh, Nate, thanks for joining me. Let me ask you the first question then. I just Can we start by describing briefly what Stream Raster and Smart View Connect are? Who are they for? Who uses them? Sure. Stream Raster is a, is a product we developed at Wolpert. It's a High performance, lightweight raster imagery service um, serves raster imagery in a couple of formats, WMTS, WMS. And it, it's really about folks who need a high performance web accessible system for serving raster imagery where they just want to give us the data and let somebody else worry about serving it, keeping it up, making sure it's performing and resolving issues that they come up without having to stand up infrastructure on their own or involve their own IT department in getting that delivered. Maybe they're in a company that doesn't have an IT department. So really kind of providing that SaaS solution that makes it easy for folks to get their raster imagery on the web in, in geospatial formats. And SmartView Connect is an internal tool that Wolpert uses as part of our aerial imagery ortho projects. So as we collect imagery and run it through the QC process, SmartView Connect is a tool that sits on top of Stream Raster, but gives Wolpert a way to put the data in front of clients where they can take a look at the data, create markups, find QC issues, and go through that, that, that workflow step of how Wolpert produces imagery and gets it in the hands of customers. Got it. Thanks. So if I recap, Stream Raster is imagery as a service. It's SaaS. We host that for customers. And you mentioned words like easy, simple, not needing to involve the IT department necessarily for infrastructure. And then the second one with Smart View Connect is, among other things, a way to view Stream Raster data and sort of our app for viewing Stream Raster so that we can do our product delivery because, you know, Wolpert owns aircraft and whatnot. We collect imagery and we can uh, use Smart View Connect to view that imagery that's in Stream Raster. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> in a roundabout way. I think I used a lot of words to say that, but yeah, you said it also. Um, okay. So if, if we sort of go back to the topic of, you know, like buzzword soup and, and how we do stuff, I, I know that today Stream Raster runs on Kubernetes, Google Kubernetes Engine, GKE since we're throwing around three-letter acronyms. But I know that's not where it started. For example, the data ingestion piece of that has even gone through a few iterations, let alone how we serve the data. So can you just briefly tell me, how did it end up on GKE? Yeah, exactly. It, it, it's there now. It didn't start there. When we got started on the project, the system was well, had containers in the mix. We were deploying containers on Cloud Run. And then the other major technology in the stack was Cloud Functions, which is a serverless technology that allowed us to do a lot of the image image processing on Google Cloud Platform. And as that started, we went through a couple of iterations. Um, it worked pretty well up to a point. And then as we started doing some load testing, we found some issues with cold starts and startup times with Cloud Run. And kind of finding those actual bottlenecks was the trigger where we started looking at using something a little heavier like GKE. And, and shifting the container workloads to GKE to alleviate some of our cold starts and work on achieving the performance goals that we were after. Similarly, our image processing pipeline was built on cloud functions uh, that worked well, didn't require any infrastructure, was very cost effective because we only paid for, you know, we didn't pay for compute time we weren't using. However, as we started pushing bigger and bigger imaging projects here, we started hitting timeouts and couldn't quite get the performance out of cloud functions that we needed to start processing these bigger imagery projects. So we went through a couple of iterations. We tried some of the K-native tools 
and then ultimately landed on a workflow tool called Argo CD, which ran in Kubernetes, which kind of got us a really interesting mix of the best of both worlds. So it allowed us to scale up to process um, very large jobs. And by running it natively in Kubernetes, we could turn more knobs around compute and memory resources and timeouts um, to allow the existing workflow and algorithms to continue um, processing the imagery. But it also, you know, leveraging that on top of Kubernetes with some of its auto um, node pool scaling allowed us to really get back to that point where we weren't spinning up a lot of unused capacity when the processing pipelines weren't running. So it, it worked out really quite well for us in the end. So you, you and I have talked a lot about starting simple and only getting complicated when you need to, right? Like focusing on business value first. Like, you know, what, what what's <laughs> when are you laying utility lines to use the electric, to use the drill, to drill the hole kind of thing? Like we're trying to drill a hole, not lay a utility line to get electricity to, to the drill, which may or may not be a great analogy. Nonetheless, I think what you were just saying there, correct me if I'm wrong, is we started with as close to SaaS products ourselves. So Cloud Run is a very, very simple, well, Cloud Functions is function as a service, the simplest thing possible. There is no infrastructure. There's nothing to worry about. And then we went to Cloud Run and, and, and finally to GKE. And as we did that, we were buying more complexity for ourselves to handle, but we did it because it was solving specific issues we were dealing with in our own product, namely throughput performance and et cetera. Is that right? Is that, am I saying that correctly? That's that's exactly the trade-off. And another facet to that trade-off that we were really looking at was sort of, could we have re-architected the implementation to fit within the cloud functions? Most likely, yes. But there was a time to market issue around of, do we, do we change the processing algorithm to fit the infrastructure or do we change the infrastructure uh, to fit the processing algorithm? And in this case, we, we, we chose to change the infrastructure. We made the change from cloud functions to GKE in about two and a half weeks from when we decided we needed to make a change to when we had it in production. And I think if we had tried to change the implementation, the algorithm and the approach of the image processing would have taken far longer to get there. Yeah, I, I know that some folks, including myself, <laughs> will, were pretty blown away when the team pulled that off. That, that, that change, that pivot. And I think that reflects some earlier decisions that were made that were really not about the infrastructure per se, but just about what's the smallest, I think to, to use a term that you use, is the smallest shippable unit. Or, you know, what is the unit of deployment? And I think you had the team focus on containerization, not, not the platform that you would put the containers on, but just having a container, an image, be the thing that would, would ship. I think that's what let you move quickly from one deployment platform to another. Is that right? Or, or am I missing? Something? Yeah, that's that's pretty close. You know, even though Cloud Functions was not a container environment, sort of having that, our, you know, a build process producing a singular artifact that gets deployed, our ability to take an artifact that got deployed in Cloud Functions and shift that to a container environment because sort of that singular artifact mentality made that a pretty easy shift. I know that you've been pulling off similar magic on other products that we we won't talk about here, that sort of uh, more proprietary stuff. Uh, but you, you've been doing, you've been reading that same pattern, I think, right? Is like get get stuff in a relatively vendor neutral format these days, which is the container, and and then start to worry about where you're going to deploy it, regardless of cloud, actually hybrid cloud approach. Yeah, precisely. And and there's a there's a couple of aspects of that. You know, we've I've been doing containers for for quite a while, had really great success. And one of the things that I found particularly invaluable about containers is really the portability. And you know, as we talk about um, building reliable systems, one of the things we found is having developers giving the developers the ability to run the exact code and infrastructure on their laptop that's about to get shipped up to whatever cloud platform runtime environment um, has, has really proven well and really lets us start running that production-like environment on the developer's laptop. So really, really early in that development life cycle. Okay. And you, you kind of remind me of something else I wanted to ask you about, in fact, and it's about, since you mentioned that being, let me just say, not vendor-specific, 
sort of a vanilla format. I, I know we've made some choices on stream raster, for example, or even smart view connect about vendor lock-in, let's say. So we don't just use Postgres for our backend. We use it running in GCP in, in cloud SQL specifically. So I guess my question to you is in the context of what you just said there, how do you feel about vendor lock-in? Is it a big deal? Is it I mean, how do you think about it? I think it's I think vendor lock-in is one of those things that one needs to keep an eye on, but like anything in technology could be taken too far to extremes. Over my career, I've watched a lot of people worry about vendor lock-in and try to design around it from the get-go. And I've watched folks spend a lot of time engineering solutions to avoid vendor lock-in to promptly never change the vendor. And so I think it's one of those keys where we kind of go back to that business value of spending engineering effort, you know, deferring engineering effort until you really know you're going to need it. And so the vendor one is, I think, you know, be careful, pay attention to the technology trends, um, but not get too wrapped up too early because there's a pretty good chance it may not be an issue. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's something I've been guilty of even way back in the distant past when I actually wrote code was uh, trying to write database agnostic data access layers using ORMs, you know, which isn't a bad thing, but then, you know, the, the thing an engineer would always say, it's like, well, what if we need to switch out the database? Which, to your point, rarely happens. Um, so it doesn't mean it never does, but, you know, do, doing all the work too soon. So uh, I think that's what I've enjoyed watching you and the team build Stream Raster is, is really thinking those decisions through and not being afraid to make a choice for a vendor-specific thing if it just saves a boatload of work for no real value. And this is where I think containers really bring bring some interesting technology to bear in the market today of really becoming a great de facto you know platform for building code where I think containers themselves bring a lot of interesting benefit to the table. The fact that I can run the same image and container on my laptop and I can ship it to AWS, GCP, on-prem, wherever, and they generally just run the same, just really opens up a, a ton of doors. You know, we mentioned GKE specifically, you know, much like SQL and Kubernetes, you know, they're, they're built on standards and platforms, but everybody gets their little vendor add-ons added on, tacked onto them as, as their specific value adds, and we hit some of that. You know, but that's where I really look at the key of worrying about vendor lock-in is containers to me seem to be the great lingua franca of how we ship code. And then saying, yeah, this system today uses this, a few GKE specific things that may not be on AKS on Azure, for example. I yeah. tend not to get too worried about, because there's alternatives. If we needed to move it to AKS, we'd figure out how to get around those pretty easily. Yeah. That, that, that actually, I, I don't know whether I led you, I, I tricked you into this connect question or not. I feel like maybe I did, but I'll... So SmartView Connect is basically a monolithic application running on a VM, or, or I should say it was until very recently when you and the team made the decision to containerize that and move it on to GKE. So, you know, that's the same end result, but I wonder if the decision-making process was the same for you, right? You were just talking about, the, you know, the benefits, the lingua franca of containers, but is that the decision-making process for SmartView Connect as well? Yeah, so if I, te if I tease apart that question a little bit, I think I, I would look at it and kind of put it under the broad, broad, broad heading of modernization. You know, as we, as we look at moving workloads in this particular case, it was moving from an on-prem VM to the cloud. And so as, as we do that sort of on-prem to the cloud migration, you know, what are the important modernization steps we take? And in this case, monolith might be a little bit of a strong word. You know, if we talk, you know, you mentioned buzzwords. You know, what's a monolith? What's a microservice? When does one bleed into the other? Um, this, this application was actually a, a number of components that happened to be deployed on a single VM. So that made our containerization effort simpler. You know, it had a front end that was separate from the back end. Um, one of the things we haven't done yet, but I think is a really interesting thing on that modernization front is the back end was written at a time where it was pretty common practice to write sort of that user management authentication and authorization system as part of the application. You know, I think that's where you kind of hit the monolith. And, and that's one, I think, where the really exciting things today when we're looking at modernizing apps is really where federated identity and access management has come in. 
and really enable people to start taking those, you know, those are hard things to get right. Uh, they're tedious, really allowing you to do things of, of splitting those things, not just to become microservice buzzword compliant, but really provide interesting ways of being able to cleave off large chunks of functionality that you could, you know, delegate to others that do it really, really well. Um, so on, that's kind of the monolith part. And then talking about VMs to containers. One of the things that we really see as a big benefit to containers is sort of configuration management practices. So a virtual machine by nature's is a pretty broad general compute platform, which has lots of capabilities that many applications don't need. So by switching to containers, you know, we hit all the things that we've talked about, about runtime portability, but it really helps to reduce our attack surface vector. We're not having services that we don't need. Things like Docker make it really easy where we've got a single file where I can look at one text file and just really quickly figure out what's installed in that thing, what's it depend on, and just really get to simpler, more straightforward configuration management practices mm -hmm. and processes. Okay, yeah. So number one, I think you may have just invented a new thing, which is a mono service or a microlith or something like that. I don't know. Um, nonetheless... <laughs> The part you mentioned there gets back to that basic premise that I think we hit on a lot, which is don't spend time building stuff that isn't core to what you do. Um, authentication authorization, as you point out, is really, really hard. It's really hard to get right. And it's not something that a company like Woolbert probably wants to spend a ton of time on. I know our team doesn't. Uh, we've got other stuff to do that's more interesting for our clients. Um, so, yeah, let, it comes down to that same thing, right? Let, build the important bits that only you can build and, and, and outsource everything else, unless there's a reason not to. Yeah, the, I, I want to ask you, a, a, it's kind of a related question there. You, you've, been, you've been talking about configuration management and, and how easy it is to, let's say, define the Kubernetes environment in a text file. I know that's something that you really brought to the team, this, this idea of infrastructure as code. Do you mind telling us a little bit more about why you think that's a good thing and how we use it? Yeah, so we use infrastructure as code as kind of our, our technique and pattern. And, and the way I kind of look at the world today is, is we're, we live in the world of, of software defined everything. And so if we're building a, an IT system, whatever, I kind of look at it as our first step should be a, a Git repo and, and really trying to put everything we possibly can under version control. And so in our particular case, we follow that pretty regularly. We, we've chosen Terraform is our infrastructure as code tool. Um, works well. It's very prevalent, supports multiple clouds. We've even got some cases where we've got some singular project that span multiple cloud providers today. And what that does, it allows us to really define everything from the network, firewall rules, databases, all the way up to the application stack um, in source code. And what this allows us to do is kind of following, going back to the extreme programming days of, you know, things that are difficult, you do often. And so by having something as infrastructure as code, it means we can build and rebuild entire things, even representing what, what an entire data center might look like many times per day. And so this means when a developer needs an isolated environment, they can spin up their own environment. They have a completely isolated stack. Uh, we use this as kind of as additionally as a cost saving tool. So in the cloud, when you're using resources, you're paying for those because we can spin environments up and down so quickly and so easily. Um, but we can save money because if we don't need a particular dev environment, but a few hours a week, we only spin it up for the few hours a week that we need it. And kind of going back to just using software development principles for managing infrastructure is that code that is run often is likely to work well. And so rather than, you know, exercising that archaic firewall rule thing that somebody built six months ago, um, when a system is built, we're actually executing it many times a day. And this further helps, you know, as we look at how do we deliver reliable systems. If, if something were to go wrong with the infrastructure, our folks can take a single command, single Terraform command, and verify that all the infrastructure is in the correct state. And for example, if someone were to log into a console, make a mistake, we can remediate that problem in a couple of minutes with a single command. Yeah, it's pretty, it's 
just first of all, thanks for going through that whole thought process as well. But it's 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 pretty mind blowing to watch that happen. Actually, it sounds I don't know if it sounds easy or not. Maybe it sounds difficult if you're listening to that. But it's amazing how it reduces the fear of change. If you know you can make a change, test the change, roll back a change really quickly and with a high degree of confidence, it, it, it makes it much less scary to make changes. And it's been kind of fun to watch. I mean, a bit nervous at first, but kind of fun to watch the product engineering team develop that muscle and be able to just ship a new version of software at three in the afternoon on any given Wednesday, because why not? Because the, the risk is relatively low. Um, you know, we don't necessarily do that for larger changes. We're not irresponsible, but it's quite amazing what that safety net enables. And the other part of that safety net, you talk about responsibility and doing it during business hours. One of the, one of the additional benefits and safety nets I see of being able to do changes during business hours with zero downtime deployments, et cetera, is We've got everybody in the office. People are fresh. It's not on the weekend. It's not late at night when people are tired, half asleep. And so if something does go wrong, we've got a full cadre of staff that are online, awake, ready to help if something were to go wrong. Yeah, being awake is a benefit. Yeah. Well, uh, Nate, that's it for this episode. Um, Thanks a lot for joining me. Um, And thanks for anyone who's tuning in here. So, I mean, if you're considering any kind of solution like we're discussing. We, we've been talking about our products, but this is these are practices we bring into our consulting business too in cloud solutions. And if you're looking to solve a problem like that, or to, to Nate's point, you want to do things during the week when you're awake and on the weekend when you're not, we hope this conversation resonated with you. So Nate, I know, I know folks can get in touch with us through LinkedIn and all the usual places, but if you also go to wolpa.com and search for cloud solutions, you'll, you'll find things we've written and um, opinions we've shared. And finally, if you have any inquiries, you can get you get in touch with us at cloudsuccess at wolper.com. But Nate, thanks a lot for your time. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.